my country, Greece, and uh, the beautiful uh, city of uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, but also, um, we are lucky <laughs> to have uh, Dr. Cadido, uh, professor of anesthesiology and surgery in Illinois University, a uh, board member of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, um, many um, um, publication with many publication, presentation, invited lectures, uh, chapters written in, uh, in medical textbook um, to explain and to teach us how to run a successful independent interventional pain practice. Dr. Pablito, you are welcome. Thank you so much. And welcome everybody. Um, so my discussion this morning will be largely geared to how to run a successful independent pain practice using interventional therapies, of course, related to the United States. So many of the, those of you who practice in Europe or outside of Europe on other continents may find some of the information not to be entirely useful. I'm going to try to limit my, my presentation to those things that I know most about, having recently become a partner in a brand new practice as of January this year after 14 years of being in full-time academic medicine. And so if you look at in the United States, there's been an exponential explosion in the growth of interventional pain physicians in the last 20 years. It seems like there are many more fellowships. In fact, I run a fellowship training program for certified candidates. There are people now who are training in all sorts of different specialties, whereas formerly this was limited to anesthesiologists. We now have physical medicine and rehab doctors. We have psychiatrists. And in some cases, we have even internal medicine doctors who are electing to train as interventional pain physicians. It seems like everybody wants to get on the bandwagon. Then we struggle with territoriality. We're fighting with our neurosurgeon colleagues who want to do the procedures that we do and take our business away from us while simultaneously restricting our ability to do some of the higher end interventional procedures. When I say higher end, I'm talking about not just neuromodulation, but things like the implantation of interspinous spacers, SI joint fusions, minimally invasive lumbar decompression. It's a battlefield. And to navigate the battlefield successfully, you have to have a plan. So if you look at the distribution of interventional pain physicians across the United States, uh, in recent years, there's a whole plethora of individuals practicing solo, all the way up to groups of more than 100 individuals. But the solo practitioner has become the dinosaur of this decade. And the reasons why are it's very expensive to run an independent interventional pain practice, extremely expensive. The overhead is at least 60%. So if you're not making a large margin and reducing costs and finding ways to reduce waste, you're going to be having minimal return for your efforts. If you see from this graphic, in the six year period of 2012 to 2018, there's been a, a modest reduction in solo practice, but over the last three decades, there's been a 50% reduction in solo practitioners, and you can see that right here from 1984 to 2014, a 50% reduction in individuals who used to practice interventional pain as soloists, who are now joining large consortiums because of the strength in numbers. And just as we've seen a reduction in solo practitioners, we're also seeing a reduction in ownership. Whereas it used to be very favorable for inter, uh, interventional pain physicians to own their own practices, we're now seeing that that's being supplanted by those who are becoming employees. Employees of what? Private equity groups, uh, larger medical centers and universities, for example, or larger group practices, multidisciplinary, multi-specialty practices. So what are the strategies that if you're gonna start out fresh today to start your brand new practice and launch a new practice in interventional pain management? The first thing to do is to consider what's called non-compete clauses. So for example, when I joined a new practice, I had to sign a non-compete. I couldn't practice within 10 miles of my previous practice. And that's pretty common. When I started my former practice, I was actually given a very restrictive covenant indicating I couldn't practice within a 50 mile radius, which is very unusual, but I had a very large drawing, not just in my own home state of Illinois, but also from Indiana and also from Missouri and sometimes from Wisconsin. So they tried to limit me to a 50 mile radius. 
and now I'm down to a 10 mile radius as I get, I guess I get less favorable. Marketing starts within your own network of friends and colleagues. You've got to have a strategy. My strategy was to create a YouTube channel in my own name where I actually broadcast myself. I advertise myself. I put all my professional lectures on my YouTube channel. I advertise not just for patients, but also through attorneys who refer patients to me through other areas of specialties of medicine. I'm getting a tremendous amount of, of referrals based upon my YouTube and my internet presence. And consider the name of the practice. In the United States, of course, you've got to consider many things, including which state, which location you, you elect to practice, and what are the tax burdens associated with starting a new business. You're basically becoming a small business person when you start a brand new interventional pain practice. There are fees attached to starting a business, legal fees, fees for startup, corporate fees, taxes. You've got to set up fees for workman's compensation. If someone's injured on the job under your employment, you have a a duty then to provide benefits to that individual person. You've got to have strategies for insurability, for insurance, for personal insurance, for health insurance, for liability, medical malpractice insurance, uh, for retirement plans and so forth, and naming conventions. You've got to be sure that when you name your practice, you're not uh, in some type of conflict with an already established and existing practice. Which address to use? It's really important to scan the marketplace, not just do a Google search, but go out and see where patients are going for interventional pain management in your community. This is a scattergram or a map of my regional location in Chicago, Illinois, United States, and you can see that I have to navigate all these different respective competing practices to determine where I should put my flag down and have a, a great draw for patients who might benefit from the things and the skills that I have. Then you decide whether or not you want to participate in insurance plans. Do you want to be in network or out of network? And there are benefits to both. Of course, if you're in network, you're going to have pretty much a stable, steady referral pattern, but you're limited by the constraints of the insurers who tend to put, uh, reduce the premium for interventional pain management. In the United States, interventional pain management is a target, has a target on its back as more and more individuals are practicing what is known as population health. For those of you who don't know what population health is, population health is capitation. It's where the large insurance companies are determining that preemptive care and wellness care should be applied for individuals to the exclusion of interventional pain management. What does this mean? That means you have a new referral for low back pain. The insurance company would much rather that you see and evaluate the patient and prescribe medication for the patient, maybe physical therapy, but not do injections not send the patient for a spinal cord stimulator or intrathecal drug delivery system. Why? Because it uses up the resources and the funds of the insurer. So you have to determine whether you elect to stay in network or go out of network. I have an independent practice on the island of Antigua in the Caribbean, which is purely out of network. It's stem cell therapy. And once a month I go down for three or four days and we attract a very wide clientele of individuals who are looking for regenerative medicine. It's totally out of network. There is no insurance involvement in whatsoever. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to go to the Caribbean or leave your home location to find such a practice. You can do these types of boutique practices, whether you're here in Europe or whether you are in the United States, and have a realistic assessment of how many patients you can attract to your practice. If you know who you can attract or who you want to attract, work backwards and then figure out where you want to find those patients. Now you need a clinic and you need a procedural space. You need a brick and mortar building actually to house your entity. And where are you going to do that? Are you going to buy or construct a new edifice or are you going to rent or sublet someplace which is already in existence? And there are benefits and there are downsides to both of these approaches, of course. Staffing is the most important thing to consider when you start a new venture, an inter interventional pain management practice which is independent. You have to have reliable people. And of course, getting good, reliable people is going to cost you a premium. And keeping them, uh, attracting them is one thing, but keeping them as an entire separate entity. All the good players go for free market economy. They're all trying to get and capture the highest resources for their services. And so what are you looking for when you place ads and do your interviews? You're looking for people with stability, reliability, and a good 
uh, pedigree of where they've been practicing previously. What should be included in the contract? Well, of course, the same type of exclusions that exclude you from going out and practicing uh, across the street or down the block should also be in something that you consider when you create contracts for your staff. Choreograph each movement, meaning everything that you do is going to involve an allocation of resources. You have to have an expenditure for capital equipment. You've got to buy things like radio frequency uh, ablation technology. You've got to buy monitoring equipment. You've got to invest in um, things for you, uh, OR tables, for example, fluoroscopy equipment, ultrasound equipment, and you've got to get the best deal that you can from these uh, vendors for these um, products. How are you gonna keep track of medical records, MRI authorizations, and so forth? Well, that's the duties of your staff. And then, of course, you've gotta manage your online reputation. The online reputation is exceedingly important. I don't know much about the online reputation of practitioners in this continent, but in the United States, it can sink your ship or it can float your boat. And so basically, we have services that are available where they're called Reputation Defender, for example, and you pay a premium of about $5,000 to $10,000 a year, and you have individuals who scrub the internet looking for every mention of your name, and anything that is adverse to you, they have methodologies for trying to remove those negative reviews. Now, why do you get negative reviews? Well, you get negative reviews from disgruntled patients. Who are disgruntled patients? They're patients who you don't prescribe opioids to, for example. They're patients who are in the workman's compensation system, for example, that you deem they're qualified to return to the workforce without restrictions, they will go online and they will bash you, and that will affect your referral pattern, that will affect your business bottom line. So you've got to have a service available to you and pay for that service to scrub your online reviews. You can ask your patients for positive or favorable reviews, but you've gotta be very careful when you solicit that type of uh, duty on behalf of your patients. Local news. Watch the news, read the news, find producers who might allow you to discuss pertinent medical issues. I've been on the radio in Chicago many times discussing things like the opioid epidemic, discussing things like the use of neuromodulation for the management of chronic intractable neuropathic pain. Find a favorable source. Sometimes you have to make an investment in yourself to do that. So many of the interviews I've done for local TV and radio have been uh, done gratis. I haven't had to pay. There have been occasionally times when they've asked me for a donation for their services. And again, the YouTube channel is very important. I can't underestimate or, or undervalue the benefit of having your own presence online. And I encourage you, if you have time, you look up my YouTube channel. It's just my name, Kenneth Candido, and you'll see some of the things that I post. Most of my professional lectures are posted on YouTube. If you're gonna be in network, you've gotta have a major affiliation with either uh, university or some type of medical center, and you've got to get privileges. I'm currently privileged at, privileged at four Chicago area hospitals, and I go from time to time to each of those places and bring cases. I need to maintain at least 10 cases per site to maintain my clinical privileges, and so I do that. Expansion. The whole purpose for starting your independent interventional pain practice is to grow and to expand. But when you're seeking expansion, you have to consider, do you want to pay the higher fees and the higher salaries for physicians, or are you looking for physician extenders, such as nurse practitioners and physician's assistants? And many times it makes sense not to get more higher priced, higher paid, higher salary physicians, but to look for lower priced physician assistants. The goal to being successful is to reduce your overhead because obviously there's a point of saturation of how many new patients you can bring into your practice on a given week, month, or year. And I'm gonna show you what some of these strategies are. Quality, speed, and efficiency are very important. So what is overhead? Well, the first three things on this list are the most important thing that are going to be costs borne by yourself when you start your independent uh, interventional pain practice. You have to pay salaries, and you have to pay a premium if you want good quality people. People are loyal only to a certain extent. At least in the United States, it's the almighty dollar which determines loyalty. Once resources start to diminish or individuals find that the same or similar practice pays them 20%, sometimes as little as 5% more than what you're paying them, they're going to abscond. They're going to leave and you're gonna be left high and dry from your best people. So you've gotta pay premiums to get the best people. Medical, surgical supplies and facility expenses, those are the other of the major expenses towards overhead. Other things are minor, but they still count. Things like billing and collecting, promotion and marketing, ancillary services. But again, ex 
expect that your support staff, your medical supplies, and your facility expenses are the bulk of your overhead. So how do you calculate overhead? Well, the Medical Group Management Association, we call that MGMA in the United States, they calculate all of these things, what the typical costs are per capita for starting a practice. They also will tell you what the average salary of all physicians are across the United States by specialty. So you can research this online. You can look up the MGMA data. Let's say you wanted to know how much the average orthopedic surgeon makes in the United States. You look up MGMA data or the average plastic surgeon or the average pediatrician or family medicine doctor. You can find this data. It's available to you and you can determine whether or not you're within a 50% range or if you're in the higher quartile or lower quartile, for example. But 60% should be your overhead, and you have to find strategies to reduce your overhead, again, because the increase in your productivity and your increase in your business model has a saturation point. Let's say you set your goal at seeing four patients per hour, which is not unreasonable. That's a new patient plus some uh, follow-up patients. Maybe every 15 minutes you're seeing somebody. Well, you might have the the idea and say, well, I'm going to see six patients an hour. Believe me when I tell you, unless you have scribes working for you, you're not going to be able to see six patients an hour and do a credible job with those patients. So how do you reduce overhead? Obviously, you have to evaluate performances and you've got to bonus people who do a great job and you've got to withhold bonuses for individuals who don't meet the expectations or the parameters that you've established for them uh, preemptively. Identify areas for improvement. Predict where your practice is going. And of course, convince your physicians who might be stuck in their old ways for the need for change. When I say need for change, have physicians who trained uh, remotely or not recently go back and learn new technologies. I learned Vertiflex mild procedure all within the last five years, for example. I increased from uh, con conventional spinal cord stimulation to DRG stimulation within the last five years. It doesn't matter what you think you know, we're obviously in an evolutionary phase for interventional pain management with an ever accruing acumen that has to be established and learned even by uh, elderly physicians. And of course, have an action plan. So the Medical Group Management Association, I mentioned that to you a few moments ago, MGMA, they suggest that there are three options for reducing overhead. You can either increase your pro productivity, again, there's a saturation point for doing that, reduce costs or improve your business operations. And there's, of course, there's only a, a certain point that you can actually cut. There's only so much fat on the steak. And of course, uh, some expenses are necessary to increase your productivity. Here's a 12-step plan for reducing medical practice overhead. Re uh, review your staffing need and make adjustments. Assess and, and systematize your compensation for that staff. Look for savings in health insurance. If you go out in the marketplace, for example, you can petition different insurers to give you better group policies the larger the size of your group. Review your retirement plan for potential savings. Also, limit payments made for sick time, limit vacations to the extent that is acceptable within the letter of the law, and re renew and review your office lease and other agreements. Optimize supplies. Don't over-order supplies that are going to sit. One of the previous practices that I was recently working in, every month they would find that they had expired medications and they had expired equipment that could not be utilized and had to be turned over. I have a garage full of supplies, of local anesthetics, of LMAs, of all kinds of things that have passed their expiration date. That's not the way to run a successful practice. Review your practice advertising, eliminate the causes of refunds to patient, and of course be careful of the petty cash fund. Remember that things like transcription and also dictation services are very expensive. It can cost up to $1,000 a month for a physician to use a dictation service by the telephone. It's much more economically feasible for them to use voice recognition software. Within 90 days of ordering voice recognition software, it pays for itself and only costs pennies on the dollar per month to, you know, to utilize and to renew that service. Telephones. Consider contacting the telephone company, making sure that there aren't any expired lines that you continue to pay for. We found this in one of our practices, that a line that had not been utilized for five years, we were still being billed for. So make sure that people are, are paying very careful attention to these ancillary expenses. Advertising, don't advertise through the telephone directory. Most people who are patients do not go there, they go online. In this day and age, people are looking for online physicians and they're looking for online reviews, which is why it's so critically important that you scrub bad reviews out of your profile. 
supplies. I already mentioned this. Sometimes you want to, instead of buying new printer cartridge, cartridges, for example, just refill prior cartridges and reuse them. Develop a system, a very dedicated system for monitoring your supplies, keeping them on track for days rather than months. The website is a way that you can create document downloading for your patients. Rather than patients coming in and requesting documents from you and you spend money on paper and printing, have the patient download them at home and print them at home. That saves on expenses. Also, this cuts down on communication and postage as well. When you're renting a facility, if you don't own your facility, renegotiate your lease on an annual basis. Do not sign a lease for more than one year. Sometimes medical practices get kind of roped into signing three or five year leases. And you have an opportunity to negotiate if the building is semi-filled and maybe the, the, the owner or the landlord is a little bit more desperate, you can negotiate a better deal for yourself. And of course, you can always look for lower rent in the same or similar areas. Collect the patient's portion of the bill up front. By doing that, by not waiting for the insurance to pay, you will see a 7% increase in your revenue stream, hence reducing your overhead per year. Call a staff meeting and, and, and offer a rebate or offer your employees a percentage, 5% for less than $10,000, 2.5% between $10,000 and above, for individuals who come up with cost saving solutions. And the solution example is given here where an autoclave broke and one of the employees said, I know somebody who can fix this pretty cheaply. And so you saved yourself about $2,500 by doing this. You should turn around some of that cost savings to the individuals who come up with this innovative solution. So we need to see more and more patients. That's the reality as we go forward. But there is a saturation point. As I stated, the optimal number of patients to be seen in the United States in interventional pain practice is about four patients per hour. Now that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't see six but because of cancellations and because of other circumstances, sometimes we see three or two or three, it's best to try to schedule within that framework of four, sometimes five patients per day, per hour. Uh, tighten up your scheduling. Make sure that you understand what, me, what medical time is. That's the time that the patient spends with the physician. There's also something known as delegatable time. That means that you see a, the, the physician extender or the nurse practitioner goes in and takes the vital signs before you ever enter the room. And they make an assessment of the patient's pain and they discuss the patient's medications and the, the benefits of using those medications or the recent response to interventional therapy that you may have performed for that patient. That's called delegatable time. What you really want to do is minimize or eliminate wasted time. That's the time when you have cancellations and you don't have anybody you can fit in a slot or somebody fails to show up for an appointment or sometimes three or four patients all show up at once for, uh, for disparate times and you get stuck because the 10 o'clock appointment decided to show up at 10.45 and now kind of crunches up your schedule. And then create common categories of care. Estimate how much face-to-face -face time you need with each patient. And also have what's called an unscheduled block throughout your day, at least one 15 minute period where if your colleague, orthopedic or neurological surgeon calls you and says, hey, I've got this patient with a hot disc, can you do an epidural steroid injection today? And you look at your schedule and say, well, I've already got 40 patients, I don't know where I'm gonna do that. Always have at least one 15 minute block open for those contingencies. So if you get those calls, you're not gonna be uh, hindering the other patients who have uh, scheduled appointments. Remember that patient dissatisfaction is the number one reason, reason for the failure of interventional pain practices. Using a scribe is very important, and that's somebody who comes in and takes your notes or does your computer medical record and charting on your behalf. That really frees up your time, and using a scribe is very cost efficient. So basically, instead of you spending 15 to 20 minutes face to face with your patient, you're spending five minutes, and you have an opportunity to see more patients in the allotted time because the scribe takes over what we used to call scut work. This type of things that we really don't want to be handcuffed with, but by virtue of Medicare and other insurers, we're, we're, they demand upon us that we utilize the electronic medical record. And you can see the graphic below. If, a, if by using a scribe, the physician is able to see one extra patient an hour over a seven hour workday, that translates to about $156,000 per year in US dollars. Um, my screen just went blank here. Okay, so basically, and that's about three times the cost of what the scribe is being paid per year. 
uh, streamline patient education, create vi educational videos for your patient, play them in the waiting room. So for example, we have videos that we have created with starring ourselves as the actors or the actresses, demonstrating for patients an anatomical model. This is your spine. This is what the intervertebral discs look like. This is what the vertebrae look like. This is a herniated nucleus pulposus. We're gonna apply an epidural steroid injection on your behalf. That's very important for not just, not just for the patient's education and satisfaction, but also what it does is it provides a medical legal framework for you and that's protection because you already have the patient who has to attest to the fact that you've discussed the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives of the interventional procedures that you perform on, on, in your practice. It also occupies the patient's time. Rather than the patient looking at their watch and saying, well, I've been here now for 20 minutes uh, past my appointment time and I'm gonna write a bad review for the doctor, they have something that they can utilize to get an educational value of seeing you not in person, but on the screen describing what you intend to do on their behalf. Uh, overhaul the referral process. Uh, how much time do we have left? I don't know. The, are we okay? No problem. Uh, one of the top reasons, again, for, uh, for patients not choosing your practice is if you have long waiting times. And these are things that are published online as well. How long it takes from the time of your scheduled appointment until the time you get to see your doctor. And so you've got to try to minimize that to less than 15 minutes. Also, to be successful, you've got to send back notes to the referring doctor expeditiously. If the, if the referring doctor sends you a patient today and then it's July 10th before they get a note on what you found with that patient, that's not going to lead to a, an ongoing, a good, strong professional relationship between that referring doctor and yourself. Timely, timeliness in seeing the referral is also critically important. If Dr. A calls today and says, I've got a patient with a herniated disc who needs an epidural steroid injection. Well, the doctor who says, I can do it today is gonna to get that patient. If you say, well, I'm too busy now. I've gotta to go to Thessaloniki. I've gotta go lecture at the meeting and I won't be back because then I'm taking the family on a, to Disney World for the next two weeks. Well, that patient's not gonna to go to your practice. You've got to have an expeditious turnaround time for hot referrals from your referral source or you're gonna lose those patients. Now. How do we reduce overhead? Well, there's two basic ways to reduce overhead. Let's say that the practice income is a million dollars a year, which is not unreasonable in the United States. That's $50,000, uh, or actually a little bit more. It's uh, in a 12 month period, it's about $75,000 per, per month for 12 months. And the overhead is about 55 to 60% right here. So to reduce your overhead down to 45%, you could either cut expenses or you can increase your productivity. If you only see two more patients a day than what you're currently seeing, and if you do two epidural steroid injections a day, add it to what you're previously doing, that translates to $200,000 a year using Medicare rates. And for those who don't know, in the United States, Medicare is the lowest reimburser uh, for these types of services. Uh, compared to commercial insurance and workman's compensation. So if you see two extra patients a day and do two ep extra epidurals, which take about three to five minutes each, you can increase on a yearly basis this. You don't have to cut your expenses that much. You're increasing your revenue flow. You can have a hybrid solution. You can choose to reduce your overhead somewhat and, and then increase by only seeing one extra patient a day and doing one extra epidural steroid injection. That still translates to $100,000 a year in increased revenue. So there's two ways to be successful, either reduce your costs or increase your productivity. Remember that increasing your productivity has a saturation point. How do you sustain the profitability? MACRA, does anyone know what MACRA stands for? It's a system that came into effect in 2015 when the United States federal government said that they were no longer going to have a sustainable growth rate for physicians, meaning they weren't going to have a yearly bump in the reimbursement that doctors were going to achieve for the same or similar types of practices. They were going to flatten this out so that basically payments remain the same through Medicare. And only about 20% of physicians actually even know what this means. But this basically means that as your expenses increase, the cost of gasoline now, $6 a gallon in the United States, right? So traveling back and forth is going to cost you more. It's gonna cost your patients more. Getting patients to travel longer distances is going to be a hassle, for example. Uh, basically because of this and the increase in 
IT information technology costs, your practice costs are continually increasing, but the federal government has determined that there will not be an increase in the reimbursement for physicians. And so there's a downward pressure on these so-called independent or solo practices. They are going out of business as the government basically drives the reimbursement. Also, the federal government is very fond of looking at things called fraud and abuse because the federal government in the United States recuperates more than $12 for every dollar spent on policing physicians. When I say fraud and abuse, meaning billing and coding for unnecessary procedures or overcoding for the same or similar circumstances or services compared to your neighbors and your colleagues. If you get caught doing that because everything has has a, a systematic approach to looking at what the usual and customary costs are. If you get caught doing that, there are very s stiff penalties in the United States, including jail time. Many individuals that I know in the community have gone to jail, lost their medical licenses, and will never practice again because of this fraud and abuse. So the federal government has no problem shutting down your business, taking away your home, putting you in jail for as long as they can if they find that you've committed fraud and abuse. There's a significant downward pressure on independent practices, and that's going to continue. So how do we sustain profitability? Well, you can do nothing. You can stay solo. And you can hope that things like Obamacare disappear. You can hope that the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians will save you. That's probably like burying your head in the sand. Or you can join an ambulatory surgery center, as I did recently in January of this year. And the benefits of that are you get partial ownership. You preserve some of your autonomy. And of course, we continue to have site of service differential versus the professional fee. So it's a win-win all the way around. Or you can join a hospital or academic practice. There's some strength and stability in joining a hospital or academic practice. You still have some benefit to leverage the hospital, but you have to sign a contract. And of course, that's subject to the political winds of fortune in your own institution. You sacrifice your autonomy when you join a hospital or academic practice, or you can go concierge. As I mentioned to you previously, this is where you exclude the input of insurance companies and insurance carriers for making decisions about suitability of patients for treatment as well as reimbursement. This is the practice that I currently maintain once a month in the island of Antigua in the Caribbean where we do our stem cell research and our stem cell procedures. Or go big and join a private equity firm. This is becoming much more uh, common now in the United States. People are joining huge consortiums of physicians with more than 100 practitioners, and there's some stability in joining a private equity group. Healthcare hubs, as I said, uh, what healthcare is moving in the United States is towards a socialized medicine model with this population health. Population health is a wellness practice. It's not to treat patients after the fact. It's trying to do preemptive care, and that's really the kind of thing that you were seeing all across the entire country and the United States. Consolidation is the biggest change in healthcare. It's happening. It's something which we didn't wish upon ourselves. It's not favorable to interventional pain practices, but consolidation is favorable for stability and sometimes for keeping out of legal trouble. Introduce new technology into your practice. Remember the opioid epidemic in the United States. Americans make up four to five percent of the world's population and consume 80 percent of all the narcotics in the world. So an interventional pain practice is very good at trying to minimize or eliminate the opioid epidemic. It costs about $635 billion in the United States to take care of pain. Pain is the number one reason in America for why individuals go to the emergency room. So introducing all of these practices, I already mentioned this, U.S. makes up four to five percent of the world population. We are the vast majority of the consumption of narcotics, prescription narcotics, as well as illegal narcotics occurs in the United States. It's a, it's a cultural phenomenon, it's a societal phenomenon, it's something which is not going to disappear. If you can offer your patients interventional pain therapy, you can market yourself as being an opioid sparing physician, somebody who cares about the community who's trying to minimize overdoses and deaths from the opioid epidemic, and that's really also very beneficial for reducing the costs of the sequelae of opioid consumption and risk. And the benefits of these minimally invasive procedures that are now becoming very popular amongst interventional therapists is that there's less pain compared to conventional surgery, like a fusion surgery, fewer operative post-operative complications, shorter hospitalization stays, uh, shorter recovery time, less scarring, less stress, reduced costs, 
and I'm gonna to try to finish on time. I didn't give a conclusion slide. All this information is available to you through the Congress. If you have any questions, here's my YouTube channel, any questions or concerns, you can reach me through my email, or this is my website that advertises my pain practice, or you can, of course, send me a text or call. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Obviously, I don't know the rules and regulations governing the European continent or anywhere outside of the United States. You've got to know, you've, it's very important if you're going to start a practice, hire a great lawyer, uh, hire an employment lawyer, hire somebody who knows, a healthcare lawyer who knows the marketplace in your location. You've got to have the backup and support of individuals who can construct as well as deconstruct the relevant laws in your community. Okay. Any questions? Question in the back. Yes. Uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, you merchandised with the other doctors in your practice. Are there also the pain therapists or the radiologists or orthopedic surgeons or some? In my present practice, we are not a multi-modal, multi-modality practice. We don't have physical therapy. We don't have radiologists. We don't have surgeons in the practice. However. We have surgeons who utilize the practice. Let me explain to you. We have an ambulatory surgery center, so we have orthopedic surgeons who will do hips, knees, and shoulders in our building. And as a corollary to that, they, they refer all of their pain patients to us. We derive a facility fee for them bringing the cases in. Um, as an anesthesiologist, myself and my colleagues continue to provide anesthesia services. So I'm, I'm wearing multiple hats. Interventional pain is what I do. Anesthesia is what I do on the side. And so we, we don't have them on premises in terms of having office space there, but they bring all their cases to the ASC. And they prefer the ASC, the Ambulatory Surgery Center, to the hospital because of efficiency, because less turnover time, less hassles in the scheduling. The hospitals have many rules and regulations which limit accessibility. For example, a hospital that I'm, one of the hospitals I'm affiliated with has what's called block time, and you're only allotted a certain number of, of scheduling opportunities per month. And so these orthopedic surgeons don't want to practice that way. They, they want to call up today and say, on Thursday, next week, I want to do Mrs. Jones's shoulder. And they're going to get carte blanche because they're bringing great business. So we don't have a formal written relationship with them to have on-site presence, but they bring all of their pain patients to us. Same with the neurosurgeries. We do it in the ASC. We do fusion operations, same-day surgeries, cervical fusions, lumbar fusions, A-lifts, T-lifts, all the kinds of things which used to be ex exclu exclusively performed in hospitals, we're doing them now in our ASC. So they don't have an office space with us, but they have a presence with us, and they see us every day. We work with them very, very intimately, and they send all of their pain referrals our way. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Other? Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.